Hi guys, it's Gabby Dunn, um, the other half of this channel. Today's episode of Bad With Money is a bit more serious. Um, huge trigger warning for eating disorders. Uh, and um, just, we wanted to do an episode about the economic cost of eating disorders, but also the personal cost and personal financial cost. So if this is something you're interested in, uh, please check out the link in the description for the full episode. Uh, the clip that we'll be playing uh, is a little bit of a, a preview of the episode, um, but please take care while listening uh, and we get really personal. So I hope you learned something. Bye. How much is the diet culture industry making off of us and how much is it like the wellness culture industry making off of us in terms of like eating eating restriction? The the dieting culture and the wellness culture, which is really just a variant of dieting culture, these industries are massive and growing rapidly. Uh, the mu multiple billions with a straight up, basically, uh, uh, slope for their profit. These industries are massive. Billions and billions of dollars are made every year, cashing in on people's fears about health issues, uh, the fears about COVID, these industries are cashing in and they have been doing this for a long time, cashing in on weight stigma and fat shaming. They've done a lot to make revenue for themselves and to become a multi-billion dollar industry. And they've done absolutely nothing for public health or to improve people's health. Is there the misconception that like all of these things, because you study the actual health part of it. So like when you see people being like, you got to work out, you got to drink celery juice, you got to do cleanses. Is that like so frustrating because it's like the opposite of what the human body needs? I'm just guessing. Those industries are just one lie after another. It's a snake oil industry that's hardly regulated. When they're telling you you need to drink celery juice or more likely when they're telling you you need to buy their dietary supplements to either supposedly boost your immune system, protect yourself from COVID, lose weight, uh, keep up with your lovers and all kinds of things they promise. It is a bogus industry, but the regulation is so weak. And thanks to the industries flooding Congress with uh, their lobbying dollars in the 1990s, the regulation is so weak that they get away with all of this while the industry just keeps growing. Uh, this is definitely an issue we've got to get better under control and better regulation. Do a lot of people like come in and they're sort of like, I'm thin, so I'm healthy. But then you like look at them and you're like, no, you're not. Yeah. Um, I just think I want to mention, I'm not a clinician. I'm a no, no, I know. I'm oh, just okay. like, <laughs> I'm just like, I, I, not to you, but I just mean like in general, like I feel like it's like someone being like, I spent so much money and I'm so healthy. And then you're like, act, you're just thin. You're not healthy, actually. Yeah. The idea that thinness equals health is mm -hmm. one of the biggest lies of the past 50 years. Thinness does not equal health. What that Putting that idea out there in people's minds, and this starts young when children are getting uh, inculcated in this way of thinking, thinking that thinness equals health is what puts people at risk for eating disorders. It puts people at risk of being manipulated by these the manufacturers of the snake oil dietary supplements promising weight loss or, or promising to make you look like the model on the front of the package. Mm -hmm. All of that is a lie and it's very much undermines public health because the thinness itself doesn't tell you if someone's healthy. It's other, other ways that, the other ways that people have much more control over, whether that's in healthful physical activity, eating fruits and vegetables, but all of this in moderation and in balance is where you can have a healthy diet and a healthy way of moving through the world. There's no sol there's no solve. I mean, I guess we're all looking for this like what what is the thing that's going to solve all my problems and it's not weighing x amount of pounds, you know? And exactly. the thing that the thing that's a bummer is like people will say, "Oh, well, you have access to all this stuff and like you know, you're you're lucky. You're, you're lucky. It's like, well, first of all, I worked fucking hard to get access to, you know, be able to have mm -hmm. a health coach that I work with. And I do work with a health coach. Like, I yeah, I work that. with one I have for years and years. Um, but I think, like, you know, it's all, all of it is, like, how you are looking at it. Because, like, 
I, yeah. I remember being in New York. When I lived in New York, I was in a relationship where the partner, my partner was like, I will pay for your gym membership. I will pay. You don't have to worry about it at all. Okay. And that was like, I, at the time I was like, that's such a nice gift. You know, that's such a nice thing for me to not have to worry about because gyms are expensive, in New, especially in New York. Mm-hmm. Did that take any like actual stress away from my life? No. Because what it meant yeah. to me was now you have the thing that you said you wanted and so now you have to execute. So it was like you have to go to the gym all mm-hmm. the time. You have to be there every day. You have to like work even harder than you thought you did. You have to take this class mm-hmm. and then also do cardio or whatever. I was like driving myself insane trying to go all the time. It was not a good time, you know. It was like – I mean, and it, to your it's point, like, kind of, it I didn't mean, cost, literally didn't cost me anything, but, like, what it cost me, what it actually cost mm-hmm. me, what it took away from my life, like, over that year of my life was not something that I can get back, you know? It was like, I was living in the yeah, greatest, yeah, focused. I was, like, living in the greatest city, you know, one of the greatest cities in the world. Did I enjoy my life during that year of living in New York City when I was, like, in my 20s? No. Because I was at the gym all the time. Yeah. So here's the question. And this is the – when I think we've talked about this a little bit, like, as friends. Like, you, you're like a Shakespeare-trained <laughs> actress. Like, you are, like, a very good actress. And the idea that, like, a huge percentage of that in, is – uh, be skinnier than this other girl at the audition, <laughs> or uh, like, or like, get a, get a health Fresh. coach, or go to the gym, or like, how how much of being an actress is just spending on your body? Um, it depends on the actor. You know, it really depends on the actor yeah. because, like, you know, for for some people their way of combating the unknowns in this particular industry is to be able to control whatever they can. And for some people, Mm -hmm. that control is the size of their thighs and whether or not their abs show and whether or not they have cellulite and whether or not their top lip looks a certain way, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, And I don't – I don't – I try not to judge that because it is such an uncontrollable – it's so uncontrollable. I mean, like, you can even book, you can book, like, your dream role and then start shooting and then be, the executives be like, mm, no. And it can be gone, yep. you know? Like, people, people don't realize that. They can just the take time. it away after, after you've booked you've it. After you've done it. it. all yes. the time. After everyone's talked about it, after everyone knows you're doing it, it, mm-hmm. could, dis- it could disappear. And so... Mm-hmm. There's a lot of feeling like I have no I have no say. What do I do? What do I do? I know. I know what I can do. I can not eat eggs. I can, you know, mm-hmm. work out X amount of times a day. But I think a lot – it is an investment. Like your self is part of your instrument. It's like you're not going to buy – I just looked over at my dusty ass ukulele. But like – you're not going to – like, if you're a professional <laughs> ukulele player, you're going to spend money on your instrument because you know yeah. that if you have the best of the best, you're probably going to book more gigs because you're going to sound better. And so, like, if you know that you're taking care of this thing in all the possible ways that you can, then you're probably going to feel better when you walk into a room and give an audition. You're not going to be self, self-obsessed. Yeah. You know what I mean? 